Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Welcome both to our participants here with us at the Royal Society and also to our online participants. Uh, this is a rather unusual, a rather special meeting of the Foundation for Science and Technology because instead of having a, uh, an expert panel on a tricky issue, we wanted to celebrate and mark Patrick Valence's fantastic five years as Chief Science Advisor, which came to an end at the end of March. I think there's a round of applause starting. You should. You should. You should. <laughs> Uh, but uh, being a group of people interested in science and technology, we weren't just going to stand around and have a drink. We thought we would turn it into a proper discussion. So I'm going to set the ball rolling by asking Patrick some questions myself to start the conversation. And then, of course, we'll turn to participants here to ask questions. And also for people online, do use the Q&A function, not the chat function, do use the Q&A function on Zoom and do start putting in your questions and do upvote questions that uh, you think are the key ones and that will help me identify uh, where we should take the conversation. So uh, everybody knows Sir Patrick who has had a fantastic career both in industry and in GSK in academia at UCL, and of course, five years as government chief science advisor. And uh, let me now, Patrick, set the ball rolling by asking you to reflect on those five years as chief science advisor. What were the, what were the high points and what were the low points? What are you most proud of? And what was the messiest, nastiest, <laughs> trickiest issue that you've got yourself involved in? Uh, I may be circumspect in that box. Um, uh, if I think about sort of the different different domains, it, it, during during uh, the COVID period, there's no, no doubt, doubt that um, I think a, a big highlight was actually the vaccine task force and the position to get that set up. And, and the day that we found out the result of the first vaccine with a 90 plus percent efficacy was was absolutely brilliant and and a, and a massive high point. Um, Another one that, that I think uh, personally uh, was was exciting was um, actually trying to ask the question, what could the world do to get um, vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics out within 100 days of a new mechanism having been identified as a 100-day mission? And um, that was, that was a, a great exercise, international exercise to, to have led. And um, I particularly enjoyed... Um, one particular moment when I was presenting to the G7, and they were all in the hotel in in um, St Ives, and I, it was a Zoom call, and um, the other I was on Zoom, they, they were there live, and, and the other two people on the Zoom were Narendra Modi and Melinda Gates, and so it was a slightly weird um, situation. And um, the Prime Minister uh, said to me, uh, "Okay, Patrick, you know, lead us off on this." So I, I talked to him and he stopped out. And if you're on mute, <laughs> I thought, I'm sure I'm not on mute. I looked around and somebody came up and whispered and said, "No, you haven't got your headphone on." <laughs> so it was his lack of headphone rather than my mute that was, uh, that, that was stopping it. Um, but uh, being part of Hundred Day Mission was was um, was definitely uh, an exciting thing. And I think you know the other things I'd pick out would be um, the uh, climate work and and getting a, a science day at cop 26 and and being able to really make sure the government was totally behind science in cop 26 and amazingly that was the first time a cop meeting had ever had a science day mm -hmm. which was quite extraordinary so so that 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 i think was good and and then on on the sort of science inside government um the way that the csa network has developed i, I really like the way that that evolved and I'm really pleased that there's now a target to have 50% of um, the fast stream with a STEM STEM degree, um, and then then the other thing which you know has to bed in and become I think um, a, a standard part of the system is the formation of the National Science and Technology Council chaired by the Prime Minister. The idea that, that science and technology is a prime ministerial accountability across all departments. I think so. That those those were some of the things that I think. Uh, um, were highlights and and uh, and I think 
I enjoy getting right. I mean, lots of things, of course, get messy, and there's no doubt that there were some pretty horrific days during during COVID, um, and it was very, very difficult in the, in the first few months with not knowing what was going on, lack of data, um, flows from appropriate places, and um, difficulty in actually trying to work out how the science advice could be incorporated into operational activities and so on. Those those were really difficult. And you know, trying to do that with daily figures of deaths puts a you know very, very poignant um, pressure into the system. Uh, and, and that I think was undoubtedly one of the most difficult difficult times, not just for me, but for lots of people and very pressurized, I think, on the teams as well in the department. Do you think we were slow on the uptake? Do you think it should all have, um, we were slow to register the scale of the problem and slow to act? I don't, I mean, obviously the inquiry is going to look at all these things. Um, uh, I think if you look at how things happened in January, including um, getting vaccines started, getting research funding going for um, uh, the viral work, the epidemiology, the um, social sciences, all of that started in January. And I don't think, I don't think that's slow. I mean, right. th th I think at that point, if you look around the world, people weren't waking up to what, what this would be. Now, you know, th then there's all sorts of questions about how quickly you can implement some of the things and operationally how things work. But I think those are questions that, that will come up during the inquiry and it's the appropriate place to do it. And what was it like working with Dominic Cummings? Well, um, Dominic Cummings was a huge supporter of science and technology. Yep. And, um, you know, uh, I think that was important, actually. Mm -hmm. he, he, he did create access to number 10. And um, he was definitely somebody who helped push the formation of things like the National Science and Technology Council. He was important to raise the profile of science and technology in government. Um, and then there's all the other bits that you'll know about, David. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you on the, on the science. And he always was and, and remains very interested in all that. Um, do you think that perhaps partly because of a result of how closely you were working with the prime minister and senior ministers during COVID, that the chief science advisor job, which was originally science for policy, also became policy for science. And is that a distinction that you think matters? The, the, the classic view would be they're rather different roles. Do you think they should be uh, disentangled? Uh, or do you think that it's rather over fastidious to try to distinguish between them? Well, they are, they are different. And, and I will say, at its heart, I think science for policy is the role of, which is, is the unique yeah. thing which yes. um, chief scientific advisors do. Because there's also lots of people talk about policy for science. Yeah. And my view is, I cannot think of a single area of government policy where science, engineering, and technology wouldn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. And it's that where the science of policy becomes so important. How do you embed that so that it's a routine part of how departments work? It's not something over there that you go and ask for yeah. when you think you've got a scientific problem. It's about embedding that in every single th thing. I mean, you think about transport. It's absolutely science and engineering. You think about our housing stock, design of cities, of course, our healthcare, our communications approach, our defence resilience, our our approach actually to the economy. I mean, every single aspect has science and engineering, and therefore you need advice of science and engineering into policy. That's not policy for science. So I think there is a very clear distinction, which is the chief, chief scientific advisor's role. It's also inevitable that you get pulled into policy mm. for science, and yet you have to comment on it because, um, in, in a sense, what you're doing is giving science advice for policy for science in that situation, because you're giving expert advice into it. But I don't think it's the role of the government chief scientific advisor uh, to design policy for science. I think it's to give advice into that. The policy design is for the policy officials and ministers. And so do you think, as, we, as the, there's going to be a separate uh, chief technology advisor, do you see any 
structural changes or just appointments and roles that bring that disentangle those more well, I think the National Technology Advisor role is very much about being linked to industry and, and uh, pushing advice on techn technologies that government would want mm. to pursue and what the strategies and policies are that go along with that. So it is more over on the policy yeah. side in terms of what levers you could pull to make sure that if we want to, as a nation, really make sure we've got the right capabilities in those things, that we get all the levers pulled across government. So I think there is a bit more of that there. And it's also the case, as I've said, that I don't think that the GCSA or any other CSA can avoid <coughs> policy for science, but you're giving advice. You're not designing it. Right. When you looking at the changes in policy over the past few years, I mean, I think one significant change has been that in the old days, science and technology was not seen as relevant for solving policy problems in the time scales that ministers and civil service advisors cared about. And now, and it is a refreshing change, and you played a key part in it, and, but Dominic Cummings also played a part in it. There's a recognition that science and technology are relevant for solving policy issues in the time in the relevant time i can remember writing to the minister responsible for disability benefits trying to get her to use a bit of her budget on innovation in technologies for disabled people and i could sense i was getting nowhere but my view is that 10 years on that kind of willingness to see science and technology as part of the policy answer has become more significant do you think that's now how much has that depended on certain personalities or do you think that is now a wider cultural change? I, th I think it is a wider cultural change and I think there is definitely pull for that. So there wasn't pull for it. Mm. it. It was a very much a push job, you know, try and insert yourself and get those yeah. comments made. I think there is a pull. It's not even across government, but there's no doubt that um, amongst any meeting of permanent secretaries, that would be a sort of positive discussion where people would want to engage and pull through. And I think ministers do as well but of course there's a dearth of people who can give that and to your point about time one of the things that's important for science advice is timeliness and and yeah. uh, you know it's no good saying um actually if you just give me another five years we can come up with your your your, your answer answer for you so i do think that this is part of why enabling the civil service to be very well equipped with scientists and engineers is an important uh, important part of this in my opinion is another change the rise of the security angle? I mean, there's always been, of course, a, a significant defense and security spend on R&D and science and tech, but the, the security perspective on science and technology has now seems to me to have become pervasive, that links between the security agenda and the civil and commercial agenda seem to be a lot stronger, partly the influence of the American understanding that actually technological advances are key competitive as economic and security feature of the advantage of the West, which needs to be protected. But how have, what, give us your reflections on how closely you felt able to link the classic civil and commercial perspective coming from many scientists who don't necessarily have any security clearance even to be in the room and equally a different group of people historically very different sitting in the mod and the security agencies have have links got stronger and is that a good thing if they have uh, i think links are much stronger and one only has to look at the uh, pronouncements of um, some of the heads of the agencies jeremy uh, fleming um, um, has been very clear about what he sees as the role of of technology and science in national security so so the other agency heads and also if you look around the world countries many many countries are becoming enabled in science and technology that weren't so it, it was very much a dominance of us europe for a long time china of course is extremely uh, good at some of this now and many smaller countries are able to do it as well so i think this is now a geopolitical and a um, security uh, issue and that was reflected in the integrated review and the integrated review which set out to describe the um, mm. position of the uk and the world and, and, and yeah. the foreign um, policy associated with that 
I think was extraordinary in that it had a chapter yes. on science and technology and it had science and technology running through every single chapter. And I, I just don't think that would have been the case in, in the past. So that did change the uh, outlook and it changed the thinking. And of course, one of the things that I think was important in that was the recognition that part of your resilience is your ability to have companies that are doing the type of science and technology that you need to make products that are relevant so that's true for resilience against you know um, natural disasters like um, pandemics and so on but also for uh, security so that link between economic and uh, security uh, matters i think is important and tell us just sticking with that for a bit long because you and, and certainly and were you involved in the drafting of the relevant chapters of the integrated yes. review and the refresh as well? Yes. And so there was a proper chief, chief science advisor. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is part of that has been exercises to identify key technologies that need support. Ten years ago, I, drawing on science and technological advice, we did the eight great technologies. More recently, Bayes did the seven technology families. That wasn't too far back. Now we've got these five technology priorities, four of which are in a kind of security dry digital com computational family, and we have engineering biology, which is the um, application in some ways of classic digital engineering techniques to, to biological sciences. Um, do you think, was there a re why, as you've ended on the five, to what extent was that just a path dependent process that there had been some interest in a particular technology at one point as a result of which you've got a group of Whitehall experts who then campaigned very vigorously for their technology and to what extent was there a rational review including of the seven that Bayes yeah. had identified only 18 months earlier that had led to this new group appearing well maybe it, I'll take one step back so in the integrated review uh, the concept of being clear as a nation as to where we wanted to play in areas was defined un under um, what was called own collaborate access so in other words you can't be we can't be no nation can yeah. be probably absolutely all over every single technology yep. and yet you want to make sure that you've got enough ability to do them if you need to do them um, and so the own position would be end to end the uk is able to do it in some form collaborate would be well we're good at bits of it and we want to do bits of it but we know we're going to have to collaborate with like-minded allies or whoever in order to make ourselves um whole in that and access would be well actually we don't think we've got a real position here of any significance but we know we might need something so how are we going to access it if we do which might be an investment or might be a collaborate or might be some sort of um uh, partnership so that I think was the framework, which then said, well, when you get, of course, when you start that, everyone says, well, my technology is own, mm. and it's end to end. Every everyone, that's yep. where everyone starts. Yep. So the question was, how do you start to disentangle that? And in in Go Science, there's now a group that's um, there to provide independent assessment of all of these technologies using a standardised framework. That provides an input, and then ultimately ministers are going to have to make decisions about where they want to do things. But I think unless we go down that sort of route, we end up being sort of half good at lots of things, and we're going to have to make some choices to where. And this is not about the, the basic science, which of course is inevitably and properly very broad. It's about where we want to grow our private sector success as well. But isn't own collaborate access um, a good example of fundamentally a security and requirement way of thinking and doesn't it sometimes generate different results than if you had a competitive a comparative advantage business opportunity way of thinking and isn't the rise of that methodology evidence of a shift in the balance of policy influence away from people who said we've got a bunch of scientists and technologists who are really good at this and it's uh, there's a big market coming up there's a big global market opportunity we're not thinking about whether we need to own it or access it we just want to make some money out of it and we think there's a chance we could here that is a 
a slightly different framework. I'm not sure it is. Actually. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it is because, um, as you just described it, that's exactly one you'd say. Well, actually, we want to have a slice of the cake here, and therefore we need to support it. And so you you would want to have a basis. And yes, you can use own collaborate access as a sort of security based approach but i don't think it is that i, th I mean frankly it's an economically right. based approach as far as I, I i see it which is where do you think you want to stimulate success and of course you've got to be flexible because stuff happens so it shouldn't in my view be applied to any discovery science i mean we should be broad we should mm -hmm. do whatever we need to do and because we live in a, a, um, a an open democracy stuff will happen that you don't plan and then you need to be responsive to it and support it. But what, what we haven't been good at is supporting our discovery base through to scaled companies. And that's really what this is trying to do. Say, so if you want to scale companies and have the ability to therefore be really good at that, that needs intervention sometimes. It needs things like supply chain um, considerations as well. If you go back again to the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, if you ask the question, where was the vaccine industry in the UK, mm. it had sort of disappeared. And it hadn't disappeared because somebody said, you know what, we don't need this anymore. It was benign neglect. And a similar thing happened to some extent around 5G. I mean, what do we need to do? So I think there are areas where it's important to at least be aware what it is you think you're going to need. and make sure that if, if that is what you want, you, you take the steps to try and, mm -hmm. try and encourage it, support it mm -hmm. in a private sector environment. I mean, it has to be led by, by that being successful, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work. It was a 5G strategy, of course. It, it happened to involve Huawei, which proves subsequently... No, that, that's, that's precise, it, was, it was a that, Vodafone Huawei. That, that's precisely the point, yeah. because under the model, you, you, yeah. you would have had yeah. to have said, we yeah. actually want to do this through collaboration with only one partner yeah. who is in China yeah. as an active decision, mm -hmm. which I don't think was what anyone meant. No. Do you think that UKRI, how is UKRI working? It's most of UKRI's life has been during your time as Chief Science Advisor. A lot of the issues you've been talking about, you could argue, fall directly into the lap and the responsibility of UKRI. Um, has it got the right role? How is it discharging its responsibilities? Give, it, give us its six year on assessment. Well, I think UKRI was set up to do a number of things in my view. One was to ensure that the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary nature of research was properly accounted for. I mean, things don't sit into buckets and they need to work across research councils. Um, the second was to try to make sure that that aspect of research funding had a louder voice inside government um, and the third was to try and make sure that the links to early stage industrial use would mm. be better and i think you know it's made progress on on those areas but um there's a lot still that needs to be done and that's been recognized by a number of reports that have been written otlin of course knows that there are things that need to uh, need to change and and it's it, it's it's easier to do all of that when you've got an increasing funding baseline yeah. not when you when not when you're trying to squeeze everything into into the same pot so i think um fundamentally there's an a, a system there that can work we do need to and you know lots of people have written stuff on this as a nation make sure that we don't turn this into a massive bureaucracy because that does not help anybody mm -hmm. and and talk, we've talked a lot about sort of policy and influence and and um priorities uh you have re briefly referred to the sort of the discovery science is the holding principle still as relevant as ever are you uh, are you uh, do you think the holding principle is rightly defined have you have had moments when you thought why the bloody hell does this stop us really getting involved in setting priorities what the no, no. well i think i think it's quite interesting because of course um very few people take the trouble to go back and read what holding actually said and one of the things that he did say which i think was a very important uh, um, part of setting up this he described specific and general research and specific research was what was dominant at the time which was research that a department needed that it would simply say do this research 
And his point was there needs to be general research, which is things that academics and others want to pursue, which creates the environment from all the other things to happen. And so that's important and remains important. And my, my strong view on this is that in any country that wants to be a science and technology based country, you've got to fund that basic curiosity driven, peer reviewed quality research. And you've got to fund it to a significant degree because everything else follows from that. And the same, by the way, is true in companies. It's quite interesting that if you look at big companies, the easiest part of any budget to cut is the research budget because nobody it doesn't actually make a difference for five years but then it makes one hell of a difference and you're stuffed and i think the same is true for nations look after that basic fundamental curiosity driven science and yes i believe that that other part of the haldane principle which is the choices as to what's funded should be done by the experts who know about it not by politicians and both in the haldane model and also in in subsequent um attempts at reform like the Rothschild exercise, one doctrine was that the, the science department or the research councils or whatever were funding the, the discovery research, if you like, and the people who would best have an understanding of how you wish to apply research were the departments and departments of state would be custodians of applied R&D budgets. Um, and you could argue over time, and Rothschild being the most famous example of that doctrine, and you could argue over time that departments started behaving the way those short-sighted companies did in your examples. The departments cut their R&D budget, so the art science budget increasingly picks up the applied R&D responsibility as well. How did you, do you think departments in Whitehall are currently good custodians of R&D in their areas? Did you have um, conversations, friendly or perhaps not always so friendly, with individual departments about what was happening to their R&D budgets? Well, so, so um, in 2019, we published a science capability review. And one of the things that we looked at was the funding of R&D in departments. And in nearly all departments, that had gone down quite considerably over a decade. And so exactly what you said had happened. And um, some departments were spending a fraction of 1% on R&D. So if you're a company and you spend a fraction of 1% on R&D, you've declared yourself to be no growth commodity company. And that can't possibly be what departments mean to be. And in fact, when I said that at the meeting of permanent secretaries, um, there was a lot of sort of reaction to no, we don't mean to be that. So I think, I think that did happen. It was it was reduced and so that has been reversed to some extent over subsequent um spending rounds and the r d budgets are increasing again in some departments uh, and the notion that this is a key part of what a department needs to care about is there in principle and the chief scientific advisors in departments we said that the other thing we said and i don't think this is quite there yet was that you, you shouldn't be able to cut that budget without the agreement of the chief scientific advisor as well as as well as the chief uh, financial officer in, in the department so i think looking after that research bit of the department r d bit of the department is very very important and uh, is the treasury an ally on all this how are you getting yeah, on well, the, well, um, the the science capability review is written with treasury for that very reason and and so um that bound them in to some extent to, to what we were doing there. And certainly I'll call out by name, Phil Duffy, who's been mm -hmm. absolutely superb in yeah. Treasury um, uh, for uh, looking after science and technology. But, um, and you'll be aware of this, David, you know, push comes to shove, all sorts of other things can take, yeah. take priority. And I think that's why insisting that if we mean as a country to be a country based on the opportunities of science and technology, this needs to be an all of government concern, a prime ministerial concern, and something that treasury, treasury backs. And tell us a bit of how the, the National Council functions, how its agenda is decided, what are the big kind of issues that it has covered already and that you might like to see it covering in the future? Well, the, the, um, the way the National Science and Technology Council was set up 
or the principle was that um, it ought to be as indispensable as the National Security Council. Because on, for any prime minister, it would be sort of inconceivable to come in and say, I don't want a National Security Council. It ought to be inconceivable to say that about the NSTC. That was the idea. And um, then, of course, the prime minister needs to determine which um, secretaries of state or ministers need to be there. And the agenda is driven in part by um, uh, a series of um, government policy priorities of areas that, that, that people want to see grow, and in part from the input from um, UKRI and others as to where they think there are big, big opportunities. And you think that's, and, and what kind of issues might it focus on in the future, if you were looking ahead now, where because it, it, it looked at some individual key technologies, and that's why one argument is there's a bit of path dependency in, in how we've ended up with the five, in that they tended to be the ones that were early picks, and the gossip tended to go around, Whitehall, certainly in the days of, of Boris, that any discussion of any particular science and technology is going to end up concluding the council, you should have a big spend in it, so you have to get in early before all the budget's spent, is the... How, how is it? Is it going to be looking at one well, particular area of science and take off to another? Is it going to look at more horizontally? How do you think? Well, it if, if, you, if you look at the 10 point framework that was published, it covered um, um, skills and education, procurement, which, by the way, I think is incredibly important mm -hmm. in it. How do you government procurement pull things through? One of the 10 was technologies. So, I mean, you're right that there is a sort of an attraction to technologies, big shiny objects um, thing, but actually the whole point was there are 10 areas that are inevitably cross-cutting. So if you take skills mm. and, uh, and, and um, education, that isn't just Department for Education. It in involves the Home Office. It involves DWP. It involves other departments that need to be thinking about that. And so those 10 things, I think, are what... NSTC needs to work its way through and say, are we happy? We've got a very clear, deliverable plan against those. And you may or may not know, but at the outset of trying to get the NSTC set up, we asked the question, how many strategies are there for science and technology across government? And the answer was there were 63. Now, you know, that's not a strategy. And so clean that up, get to the 10 areas that must be covered and go through them systematically to make sure there is a delivery plan against them right. to do things. That was the that was the yeah. idea. And that's, the what uh, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's not it's not my. And job. the framework document that came out just recently, earlier this year, yeah. is a kind of account of that, a distillation right. of that. And you basically are saying that that you regard as as an agenda, working through that yeah. as an agenda for the future. Um, we've got. It's interesting seeing what's coming in online, and of course we'll come to the audience as well. But yes, it's helping indicate further areas to talk to and just uh, to talk about one issue is you mentioned just in your list of 10 education and skills and there have been some questions including from Francis Cancross online just about um, what what kind of university courses you would like to see when you say 50% STEM um, of course there are STEM courses that are very narrowly and particularly focused on a discipline you can you envisage um people being able at university to do courses that combine stem and also some economics or, or even dare one say it's political science linking their stem interest to the world in which they'd have to function i mean if you have you sat in so many discussions well has it left you with a view about the right direction in which our education and skills system should go well, I, I, I talked about this um, right at the beginning of my five-year tenure, and as always, somebody at the back of the room put a hand up and said, there's a course called PPE. Why isn't there a course called PPS? Mm -hmm. Politics, philosophy, and science. And actually, I've asked this numbers of vice chancellors yeah. that question since. Is that something that would be worth thinking about? So I think, look... There's no doubt that we need people who are deeply specialist in certain areas and have got um, real focus on things. But I think there are many more courses that, that, that could actually combine areas. 
And if you look at innovation and entrepreneurs, the idea it's all STEM people that do that is nonsense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it requires arts, humanities, social sciences, and others involved in it. So I think what's important, and the reason the 50% STEM target for uh, the civil service is important, is because in the science capability review, we found out that the current situation is 10%. Well, it's crazy. In a, in a world that's completely... Um, becoming dominated by science and technology advances, that you've got 10% of your graduate scheme with a STEM degree. So the 50% is not a magic number, it's just to try and rebalance to something which seems a bit more sensible, but it, but it's, it, and it should not be 90% STEM, right. for sure. But isn't part of the answer to your question, your, your challenge to the vice chancellors, it's a kind of producer capture that the physics, the physics lecturers at university want to teach people who already know a lot of physics, and they don't want particularly to teach people who haven't done a physics A level. And the people teaching economics the same. So specialization, the bane of the English system, is partly driven by the, the, uh, the academic community's desire at university to be recruiting and teaching people who already know quite a bit about their subject. And breadth is hard to achieve in that system. We, I mean, there's an, I mean, the Royal, sitting here in the Royal Society, successive presidents of the Royal Society, I know almost every former education minister has come to the conclusion that early specialization and the three A level model is the bane of English education. Do you, would you, could you envisage a world in which we didn't miss, repeat Labour's mistake in 2005 of, of kind of jump, uh, dumping the thing, but said, uh, we love A level so much. Why don't people do five or six A levels? Why? And probably a maths A level is one of them and, and adjust A levels a bit so that each A level doesn't require quite so much. And it's reasonable to expect someone to have continued doing some maths and to have done some history and to have done a science. Uh, you know, is that a, is that a vision? When, uh, you're, when you're, you're on a roll here, David. I can see that. <laughs> well, um, well, the, question, uh, the more important question is whether you're on a roll, well, whether you think that this is an agenda uh, that think, you would back yeah, to I think become the, a free, the, the, free um, agent. The Royal Society has actually argued for this. Yeah, it and, has. Uh, and, Absolutely. And actually the Council of Science and Technology has yeah. argued for this. And I chaired the co-chaired the Council of Science and Technology. So I think a, a broader education is something yeah. that's important. I think what we shouldn't lose though, and this is the this is I think the real difficulty in some of this, is some of our sort of specialism actually has led to some really great people who've done extraordinary things. And and so what we what we absolutely need to watch out about is just sort of superficial generality and that that, that i think is 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 the challenge but we we are in my view too far over on specialism too early yeah and of course the americans do it by it's really the masters where you start getting dug in and they yeah. do have this extraordinary range earlier looking looking at the questions coming in and i will come to the audience here in a moment we haven't touched on europe pick some questions about Horizon Europe, whether it's yeah. the value of associating with it versus the view that really post Brexit associating with Horizon Europe now is a much inferior deal to what we had. Maybe we could do better on our own. Where, where are you on all that very live issue at the moment? Horizon. You're pro it. Yeah, completely. I mean, it, 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 it's a no brainer that we should do Horizon, in my view. Um, it is, if you think about how long it took for Horizon to get set up and working properly, these things aren't made overnight and they take a time to get operating to get the collaborations working and at a time when you've got if you just took a security angle for this if you took a rise of uh, of china uh, as a as a real um science and technology power you take the um the changing um uh, views in, in, in terms of sometimes the way other countries want to collaborate the idea that europe would disable itself by us not be us and us disable ourselves by not being part of that i think is wrong and um i think it's a very good scheme that also provides two things which are quite difficult to get at in other ways one is it's a different set of review processes and reviewers who come up with different answers to the ones that we do domestically yeah. and that's always the case and the second is scale yeah there's a scale point that we cannot replicate on our own. So I think Horizon is important for us. I think the EU has made it clear. I mean, I, I think it's terrible that it got caught up in the Northern Ireland Protocol. 
that's, that's incredibly bad that it got pulled into sort of uh, um, political football as part of that. But the EU's now made it clear that they're open for us to join and um, the government has previously committed to be part of it. And I understand there's got to be a negotiation around the new terms and so on, but I hope that that's dealt with as quickly as possible and the sooner we join the better. And plan B is plan B. Thanks very much for that very clear answer. Um, now we have people here in the room it, and it's an opportunity for you to put your questions. If you could identify yourself particularly, that will help our online participants, right? Yes, uh, Gavin, there we see a suitable first question. Yep. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Simon Case, Cabinet Secretary. Um, oh, Gould. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is where I get to turn the tables on. <laughs> Um, you've talked about our ambition around the fast stream, uh, 57. What more can we do to get people in um, from science and technology backgrounds sort of in, in mid-career into, into government? How do we crack that nut? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, Simon. And um, I think uh, there's no way we're going to win on salary. Mm -hmm. And so what are the things you can win on? Purpose. And that is important. People do care about that. But there's another practical thing, which is speed of recruitment. And, you know, it was possible, and I know it was an extreme situation, but it was possible with the vaccines task force to get people in quickly. And it is, if you do it quickly, you're in competition with business. If you do it slowly, so you say, well, actually, um, we're quite interested in having you into government but it's going to take us six months to go through a process to get you appointed. Business has already snapped them up and we're done. So I think speed of recruitment and then once inside government, we need to be clearer about career paths for people. And of course, we need movement back and forth between the two. So the practical steps, I think, are um, jobs which describe purpose very clearly and speed of recruitment uh, would be important. Very interesting. Uh, thank you. So, Gavin, why don't you cut across there? Yep, there we are. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Main. I'm the director of Case Campaign for Science and Engineering. Thank you. It's been really interesting listening to you. I'm, I wondered, I'm really interested in your thoughts on the phrase, follow the science, you know, which came through quite prominently during the pandemic, um, and in particular on um, the impact on public engagement and understanding of scientific process. So I, I can imagine this either way. Well, when I first heard the phrase follow the science, it stopped me short and I was quite worried about it. But on the flip side, I thought, well, maybe this whole um, time is a time when the public can really see scientific process and uncertainty up close. I'm just it really interested in your thoughts on how the pandemic has impacted on yeah. public interest and engagement in scientific process. Well, there's no doubt, I think, that the, the, the pandemic did cause a massive upswing in public interest in, in science. And, in, and, and you know, there were lots of um, armchair virologists, epidemiologists, whatever. And that, that's great, actually, that they were engaged. I think follow, if follow means slavishly follow, it's a complete misunderstanding of how things can and should work. And so I much prefer informed by the science. And I think there's a very real danger where often non-scientists view science as completely black and white so that you know this is the answer and therefore we will follow it whereas it's uncertainty which actually is the thing that scientists are always trying to understand how to reduce that uncertainty and so in giving science advice it's important to make sure that uncertainty is properly described and people understand what may be done to reduce that uncertainty and there is a fundamental sort of philosophical difference almost between, um, uh, um, I don't know if it's, it's philosophical, but there's, there's a difference between scientists and, 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 and non-scientific politicians here. And that, and that is as follows. As a scientist, if somebody tells you that new evidence has come in that makes you think that something you thought was true before isn't true or is different, we actually love it. You know, it's, a, it's actually what we, you know, you think, oh, it's really interesting. I'd never thought of that. What a clever experiment. It's made me rethink how I consider such a problem. If you're a politician or a journalist, for that matter, that's a U-turn. Yeah. 
And, and that's, you know, I know it's a trivial point, but it's sort of not trivial because if you're not careful, that's how this gets, gets uh, portrayed. So that the certainty of science, which is often perceived by non-scientists, it must be true, it's scientific, is the thing that we need to be very careful about. We need to make sure that uncertainty is described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and right at the far corner there, the back, yep. And after this, I'm going to go to another online question. Yeah. <clears throat> Stephen Ben, I'm very sorry, Patrick, that I missed much of what you said. David, for some reason, got here before I did. Um, what I wanted to ask you was about the current structure of government in respect of science, the new department, the various councils and so on that have been set up. Looking back, would your job have been made easier if you'd had the current structures dealing with science and government now, uh, that you, uh, if you'd had that at the beginning? Uh, well, I, I definitely think the National Science and Technology Council would make things easier because it actually is what drives authority across government in terms of getting it, getting the implementation of science. But it, it is it is about things that aren't necessarily directly in the GCSA's remit, which, as we discussed earlier, was science for policy. But yes, I think the NSTC would make a difference. And I welcome the formation of a department focused on science and technology because it elevates the science and technology foundational uh, work to a cabinet level position and that that i think would would make it easier so i think yes is, is the short answer mm. to that one question that's come up online um is about uh climate change and you briefly referred to that and and bringing science into cop 26 uh, but it has prompted some other questions i mean are you confident for example that science will remain embedded in the cop process do you think that is a permanent gain and um, how do you see both Britain and other significant global players advancing the COP agenda? Are you fundamentally an optimist or do you worry about some of the pressures we now face? Well, we managed to, um, for COP27, uh, there was a chief scientist appointed there and they did have another science day. Um, so I hope this starts to become a sort of regular thing, but each country has to do it the way they're going to do it. Uh, the, the idea was that, that the notion of having a chief scientific advisor for every COP would become embedded. It's done two, let's see whether, whether it does three. Uh, and if so, I think it does then start to become embedded. In terms of am I uh, an optimist uh, or pessimist about um, where, what needs to happen, I am a really clear, pragmatic um, realist about this, which is and I think there is a group of people that are needed to make sure that we get the um, net zero plans in place, and that is engineers. Engineers are critical to this, and this is a big systems engineering problem. Of course, the most uncertain bit of the system is behavior. So I'm not talking about this as all nuts and bolts engineering, but it is a systems problem with a major uncertainty bit, which is behavior. And, and I think that does require um, engineering experts in a team at the heart of government to try and get some of this done and to have very clear delivery plans. It doesn't need endless new policies. There are, if you, if you just work back from 2050 and ask what do you need to have in order to get your technology at scale by 2050, you can't start dreaming about technologies that haven't yet been invented. They have to be things that you can already see or feel or touch or know that they're there and, 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 and plausible and they need to be scaled and done. And, and that scaling is a big R&D problem. And that's where we need to focus as well as funding all the research that's going to be needed for 20, 60, 70, 80, 90, where you may get new things coming along. But we need to focus, I think, on that engineer-led delivery of the things that, that are required. And you've presided over a significant increase in the budget for nuclear fusion. Would you put nuclear fusion now in the category of relevant for getting us to 2050, or do you see that more as research for beyond? How optimistic are you that we can raise the pace of advance on fusion? Well, I'm, I think there have been significant advances in fusion, and um, 
there was the experiment last year where mm. um, more energy came out than went in, although actually if you took the total energy required to put the energy in, it didn't any get anywhere close to that. So there's still quite a lot to do. But it is, it's a point of principle. That was an important right. step. Um, I do not think that, I hope I'm proved wrong on this, but I do not think that fusion is going to be a significant part of our solution for 2050. Right. I think it will be thereafter, but, but, but not, not for 2050. Let's collect another set of, uh, of interventions. I think Hayatum, who was glowing during, from the Royal Academy of Engineering with your references to engineering, I think we should definitely go to Hayatum next. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Hayatum Salim, CEO of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Yes, you've done such a fantastic pitch for engineering. I shall not mention it at all in my question. Um, Patrick, you are uh, relatively unique in having had leadership roles in a clinical, academic, industrial and government context. And I'm wondering what that experience leads you to think about the way that we select and train our future leaders in research and innovation. Um, you've got this 360 view. Are there, are there reflections based on that experience that you think we should be building into the way we train our future leaders? And then link to that, the sort of inverse of Simon Case's question, which is how do we better prepare our researchers and innovators and engineers for entry into the government machine so that they can actually land and be effective there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, all I can say, Hyaton, is um, I learnt a lot in each of those different sectors, and I learnt things I didn't know I didn't know. Um, uh, so, uh, particularly uh, when I moved from academia to industry, I, 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 my eyes were opened to all sorts of things that I didn't really understand before. Um, if you couple that with the fact that the life expectancy of somebody um, age 18 now means they're going to be working till they're 90 or something um there's plenty of time for lots of careers and and i do think that moving moving around is mm -hmm. actually quite quite important and greater porosity of careers between academia government industry and so um it's very very often these things are seen as one-way moves and i think we've got to make it easier for people to move back um you see that in some places. So if you go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, or indeed you go to the West Coast from a uh, US for a tech point of view, people move in and out of um, tech companies and academia and back again. And there's a very fluid movement. And we're beginning to see that here in parts of the UK. We're not seeing it yet in and out of government. And that is important because a one-way step is very different from a part of I'm moving, moving in and out. And um, I think that's part of what government needs to do as well, is to, is, to, is to make it clear what a career might look like where you spent you know, five years in government, 10 years somewhere else, five years back in government after that. That movement, I think, is, is gonna be increasingly important, not for everybody, but for, for some people. And what might it be for you? We know there's the Natural History Museum, but tell us, as, as you paint this picture of careers until the age of 90, you've got a lot to do yet, Patrick. What's no, no, hang on. <laughs> I, I was very clear. I said, if you were 18 today, I'm not. My life expectancy is considerably less than that, David. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm massively enjoying chairing the Natural History Museum. I'm slightly worried that, because it, it's really only a, a day a week job, that at some point someone's going to come and say, to um, uh, uh, Doug Gurr, the director, could you please tell the chairman to stop spending so much time in the Beetle collection? He's annoying us. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I've got to watch out for that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm massively enjoying that. Uh, I'm spending some time um, uh, helping Aria a, a, a little bit, and um, uh, and I'm saying no to everything else at the moment. But I am, I am, I am. Um, writing a book, but nothing to do with government or anything like that. Okay. And what's the book about? Uh, well, it's going to be, when I finally get round to, to doing it properly, um, it's going to be about a particular interaction between um, two 18th century scientists. Uh -huh. And I'm saying no more at the moment. Right, right. Okay. Now, let's get at the front. Right, let's, the, the, there we are. Yes. Hi, thanks. Andrew Ever at ERA Foundation. I um, want to refer back to your comments about R&D spend by industry and the ones that don't spend very much are the ones that fail after five years. I make a simple analogy about the education system. So if we're not spending enough upfront, we end up not having the right scientists and engineers, and you mentioned the need for engineers. So what are your thoughts on what can we do to make sure that we develop the right education system prior to the specialization that gets people interested in engineering and science 
so that we can we, we're not at the one percent level we're at the five percent level yeah um well i think i think yeah, obviously i don't know the answer to all these things but i i am really struck by something that Ottoline um Lazo, who's head of ukri has says repeatedly uh which is um one of the problems i think with the way we think about science in this country is it's seen as something other you know it's done by people who aren't like me who are um happy to be in a white coat in a corner doing things on their own and as long as science is pigeonholed in that way we will always struggle to get certain groups of people to engage with it and i think it's not it's a problem solving interesting way in which we think about a structured way of thinking to solve everyday problems and i think teaching children not the endless facts of science but the method of science is intuitively attractive and after all it's it's actually what people do i mean that they, they in their in their daily lives they they try things out and things don't work and then they try something else out and they use that methodology and children actually learn to walk in that way so so i think it is it is attractive if it's taught in that way and then the second point and i really i really saw this a lot when i was at gsk is when even those children who were doing science came in and saw science being applied to something that they cared about so the example that sticks in my mind is having school children visit to look at the work we were doing on malaria suddenly they say okay i now get why i'm doing this because I can see how it applies to what you're doing. So I think those two things are important to try and engage people in in science education. But I mean, this is a long-standing uh, problem. But uh, you, you know, you are right. It starts at a very young age. Uh, gentleman, right at the back, and then we'll come to Virginia at the front. Right. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the conversation, Patrick. My name is Peter Bonfield. I'm Vice Chancellor, University of Westminster. I just wanted to explore something about the future of work and the cross disciplinary approach and apply to engineering. I spent most of my career working in engineering. I've been at the University of Westminster for five years and I've suddenly had this enlightenment about the arts, the humanities, humans behaviors and and last year published a report with with Helen Atkinson for EPSRC on tomorrow's engineering research challenges. Um, what I've seen and what that showed was that the work showed that when you're looking at engineering solutions to solve the problems in an equitable, fair way that work for people, it's absolutely essential human behaviours, economics, geography and other things are included. So the review we published said you've got to think about engineering inclusively and it's an essential part of you know, funding research is that it also thinks about the impact and how you connect these other disciplines. Um, and then within the University of Westminster, we're combining in our educational program, you know, humanities students or political science, political students with science and other things so they can. Anyway, I'm just really curious on your view on the future work. We've got AI coming through. A lot of the stuff that I have spent my career practicing is now being done by um, aut automation. And I'm just really curious about how you how we maximize impact through this cross disciplinary, multidisciplinary way of being and i'm really curious about where you see the future of work being what type of jobs are going to be people people are going to be doing to live the sort of future especially with ai ai yeah as I, a sort of underpinning change i i don't have the answer to that any more than than you or anyone else does but i do think that we are entering a period of extreme disruption in the workplace because of um uh, the advances in ai and um, everyone knows about generative AI and, and what we can already see. But in a way, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And you could argue some of what we currently see is a sort of neat trick that looks, looks glossy and exciting. But underneath that, there are some very profound changes and professions will be disrupted quite significantly and many jobs will be disrupted. And um, it is in that sense now genuinely like um, the industrial revolution impact on how we think about jobs and that's going to require not only thinking about what that means for education in schools but it's going to mean thinking about reskilling people as well and that I think is a big task for the department for education going forward how do you think about reskilling people in the uh, workforce as these jobs get 
changed. I, I, I don't think, I think now that the impact of this is bigger than anyone would have thought even you know, four or five years ago. Thank you. Yes, Virginia, and then I'm going to take a couple of online interventions. Well, Patrick, um, many thanks, and thanks for everything you've done all these years. We talked, um, Simon Case's point about people coming into government service, science service. How difficult is that for people from the commercial world? I mean, I know Doug Gurr has, but there are real issues around salaries. I mean, is that an issue? You didn't quite answer your own question as to why you did it. You said something about purpose, but is there an issue around motivation and can that be better articulated? And I've got a very self-serving comment. I mean, what is the role of the House of Lords in terms of their Science and Technology Committee? Because having been a member of Parliament in the Commons and knowing how you get kicked around on many of these subjects, it feels as though the House of Lords is a much safer environment for having a proper approach to science. And if we don't, we just need more fellows of the Royal Society appointed. Um, so, so I think you there is a real problem on salaries in terms of getting people from industry into government and indeed from academia as well. But um, the danger is that you'll only get people who've actually been in industry at a very senior level and have earned money and are happy to do it for much less money. That's not the right answer. That said, motivation of purpose and you asked me why i did it it was purpose it was because there's something really important to do then i think that's that's where government wins out i mean people actually want to do something that they think makes a big difference and um there it's an attractive option but people are not going people with you know in their 30s or whatever with families taking a big salary cut's difficult at that time and so we do need to be realistic about pay scales to some extent. I mean, there's no way government could or should match industry, but there needs to be some movement there, in my opinion. But I think we need to major on purpose uh, because that's what's going to capture people. And particularly, many young people are very, very concerned about, you know, the future of various aspects of society and the world. And that's what that's where they can make a difference in government. So I think that's a pretty big sell, actually, that you can you, you can get for that in terms of in terms of the House of Lords. I, I mean, it is fundamentally a sort of revisionist chamber and that needs experts. So I think it is an, 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 and there are very few um, MPs who've got that level of expertise. And I think there's a value in in a revisionist chamber rather than a sort of um, uh, primary deciding body to, to have expertise in it and and and, the, and it's always noticeable when when one goes in front of a select committee in, in the house of lords that you do have more expert questioning there's always room for an extra one isn't there the uh, <laughs> to an extra member of the lords uh, i'm not sure that's true actually <laughs> <laughs> so it seems to me there are quite a few people there yeah. <laughs> um you mentioned in passing, Patrick, that one of your, uh, the, you, there's alongside the Natural History Museum, helping ARIA, and we've had some questions online about ARIA. What, uh, in a way, the fact you are devoting time to it kind of suggests uh, you do think it's significant. One question that came in is, ARIA going to be super important or a bit of a distraction? Ha tell us how you see ARIA playing out. Well, I think it's, it's an alternative funding source. It's, it's absolutely not, oh, there's the answer, everything else is not the answer. UKRI is fundamentally important, the big funding mechanism, really crucial that continues and does a good job across its councils. ARIA is something different and it's an experiment. I'm uh, very impressed by the CEO that's appointed mm -hmm. um, and they're in the process at the moment of appointing programme directors and the program director role is a really interesting one mm -hmm. and it's like the um roles they have in the arpa yeah. various arpa models where that person has a lot of resource that he or she can apply to the problem and selecting the problem is the key yeah. issue and so it's just at that stage and so i don't know how this is going to play out but but it's a very very interesting group it's incredibly motivated they had 
something like 380 uh, credible applications for seven program director or however many it is, five program director roles. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see where they get to in terms of who those people are and whether they can uh, really make this work using academia, industry and other, other um, research active individuals and institutes to get this um, to answer the questions. But the, the real issue with mm -hmm. ARIA, as with ARPA, is what's the question? Yeah. And, you know, I love the simplicity of some of the questions that, that ARPA's had over the years. The one that, that, that um, is particularly attractive is when Treasury in the US went to all the departments and said, we're fed up. This is a long time ago now. We're fed up with you asking for a bigger and bigger computer every year, and we have to do it for every department. Can't you get these bloody things to speak to each other? And so, oh, that's an interesting question. Yes, we probably can. And that led to ARPANET, which led to the internet. So, you know, let's have a few questions yeah. like that to throw to ARIA and see what they can do. Of course, and maybe your your engagement will help with this. The when Theresa May's government was setting up in very broad terms uh, an industrial strategy challenge model. There were uh, there was then an exercise where the people tasked with turning the very broad challenges into much more specific questions to be answered, uh, went to DARPA and came back and said the program director at DARPA is the right model and um, wanted to operate on a program director model. And first of all, the Treasury said you can't possibly pay the salaries that you envisage being necessary. And I think, and you can, it'd be interesting to know your views on this, I think ARIA doesn't have some of the salary controls that the rest of Whitehall has. And the Treasury also said we can't allow individuals to make these really big decisions. We need a committee. And in fact, they ended up with two supervisory committees separately, each requiring monthly reports on what they were doing and how they were deciding things. So there is a process whereby these ideas do get stifled. And one, I guess, one of the hopes across Whitehall is if ARIA shows it can work, a lot of other people who have previously tried to get these freedoms and haven't won might have a stronger case themselves. Do you see ARIA as perhaps a model so that we start getting a bit more flexibility in the system? And there are, there are people who would say that sadly, um, even in the last few years, the general level of uh, supervision, control, scrutiny has become more intense so that the speed of decision taking has, if anything, diminished. The business case process has become ever more elaborate. And as well as an opt out from that from ARIA, isn't there also an agenda of trying to make the main core of the system a bit more flexible as well? Yeah. So on, on ARIA, if you go back and look at what previous you know, directors of DARPA and, and ARPA and IARPA and all these other things have said, it, the, the one that sticks in my mind was um, these models fail because people keep it on too short a leash. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's, the, that's the real danger exactly. that you, 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 you bring this thing so close that it, it gets stifled. And it's been set up really well with a structure that keeps it arm's length. And um, I think that's very important to maintain. Um, actually, Stephen Benn at the back was asking me when, when uh, at a previous meeting, when, when the House of Lords Select Committee could have the CEO of ARIA in front of them. And my answer was not at all. <laughs> Let him get on with his job. And um, by all means, ask the chair of ARIA to go and spend some time there. But uh, we've got to give this a chance to succeed. And then Yes, from that, if it succeeds and if it works in a different way, maybe that model can be applied elsewhere. And I think, you know, Paul Nurse's review of um, the need for diversity in the funding landscape is important. And the various reviews, the grant review and others looking at bureaucracy in the system. It's not just in this UK, that's in just in the UK, it's happened elsewhere mm. as well. And, and you know, I, I saw, saw a number of a few years ago that the average age at which somebody now got their first R01 grant in the US was over 50 mm. in some discipline. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and you've got to make sure yeah. that we give money out to the right people quickly to get some of these things done. And and that I know is what Otlin and UKRI is now trying, trying to look at. Like that is important. Yeah. Another area where we could be more flexible, which is one of the items on your excellent list of, of 10 key uh, objectives 
is procurement, which yeah. you've referred to briefly, and we've had a couple of questions about that. Uh, and again, if you look into the detail of the Treasury procurement rules, you begin to see why we've never been able to use procurement the way they do in the US. You go to a US conference and you'll find someone with an exciting new design, engineering often, as you're saying, and you'll ask him how he's funded and he'll say, I've already sold the first 10,000 to the DOD, um, even though he hasn't got beyond the prototype stage himself. As you know, treasury rules mean that you can only pay out for stuff after it's already been delivered. It makes it very hard to procure data, which is a really, wearing my hat as chair of the space agency, it's incredibly frustrating. We can't promote satellites by buying data. It doesn't seem to be within the Whitehall procurement rules. Have you, do you see a scope for um, innovation in procurement? So we finally get some of the effects that SBRI has delivered in the US? Is that going to be a cause? Yeah, I, I mean, the reason it's one of the 10 things is because it needs to be looked at specifically. Yeah. And um, I hope that that's what NSTC will do. And um, there are a number of issues around procurement. I mean, you, you're right, the US does it well. If you look at um, many other countries, they use procurement as a way of pulling through innovation. Israel does it in the areas it cares about water, you know, cares about water and it's got lots of pull through for innovation through procurement there it cares about military and defense it uses that to pull through um, uh, uh, um, advances and um, Singapore does it I mean various countries use use procurement to do this it does require um, a different type of procurement and it also means being prepared to deal with SMEs and at the moment, it's very, very difficult for SMEs to engage with government. And by the way, this is not something that's unique to government. Very big companies have often found it very difficult to deal with procurement from small companies. So very big companies tend to go for other, other primes in order to procure their things. And that model has been disrupted, certainly in the pharmaceutical industry, which I know that changed dramatically about 15 years ago. And that required a different procurement organization. Right. Very interesting. Now, we, um, we're getting, we've got a, I, I see, in fact, I think what we might do, I see several hands coming up. What I'm going to do now, you've been incredibly uh, resilient. We've been going for well over an hour. I think what we might do now is collect a range of interventions all in one go. So keep your hands up so we can see and then um, invite Patrick to look at them in aggregate. Let's start at the front here and, and work back, yeah. Uh, Admiral Lord West, uh, Simple Sailor. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much indeed for that. What I really wanted to feel for was how, in, in your role, how much impact were you able to have, for example, on you? We talked about resilience again and again and again, and resilience is a classic of needing end to end if you want something that's really important for your nation. And so, for example, the PNT, the decision on OneWeb, was it just an intelligent decision? How much of an input did you have into that? Are you able to give an input into semiconductors and chips, how important they might be? Or is it really a decision made by the National Security Advisor and his team or some dreadful admirals or someone like that? How much impact did you have on those decisions? Right, Chris, impact. and let's keep on going. Yes, head, head back to the two questions in the middle there. Yes, yeah. Hi, uh, Rupert Lewis from the Royal Society. Um, Patrick, at the end of last year, the UK, uh, the Bank of England offered to mobilise about £70 billion to solve our local financial crisis. And yet, during the first year of the pandemic, only $7 billion was spent on vaccines for the whole world. The public health and the science world don't appear to be able to mobilise the resources that the finance and economic world can. Do you think that dichotomy is recognised? And if not, what, what does science and public health world need to do to get more, more economic traction? Right, we're collecting, and yes, then, yes, exactly. Yep. Hi, um, Cathy, I am at the Institute for Sustainable Resources at UCL. Um, my question's about the communication of scientific uncertainty, and especially in light of the COVID pandemic and to a certain extent, climate change, the proliferation of misinformation and the role of government and the government chief scientific advisor in addressing that and the fact that there might be different levels of uncertainty in scientific debate. Right, and then next door to you, yeah. Hi, uh, Adip Pondekar, Food Standards Agency. 
Um, I know you, in your time at GCSA, you always used to champion uh, diversity and inclusion. I was wondering, in looking back at your time at GCSA, what would you say were the greatest advances when it came to diversity and inclusion in the government science system? And what are the biggest challenges that you see still remain and how would you solve them? Right, those are four quite meaty questions. So let's give Patrick a moment to answer those, then we'll collect another batch. Okay, so on the, on the first question, um, those are all, all sorts of areas that government chief scientific advisor would have uh, input into. Um, doesn't mean that you do necessarily get the chance to do that, but those are areas that are absolutely in scope and um, would be expected to. And some, sometimes, of course, decisions are made completely outside that system, but in general, those are areas that I, I would expect a GCSA to, to be involved in. And, and how weighty was your... I'm trying to judge the... Well, um, it, it, it varies. So there, are, there are times when um, it becomes very weighty, and um, there are other occasions when a decision has been made, a political or other decision has been made, and then it's much more difficult to influence, influence that. But I think um, my experience was that my opinions were listened to, and part of the reason that they were listened to is because the GCSA doesn't really own a budget, and therefore can be seen as a neutral broker in this, and that makes it actually very influential. Um, mobilizing resources is very important uh, question and one of the areas which I think I mean away from the one you you raise uh, which is crucial about um, a global um, uh, raising of funding for, 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 for health reasons but there is a more um, parochial one in the UK which is um, we've been very bad at mobilizing pension funds into science and technology investment and the area that we don't do well on is scaling up companies in the UK we're not bad at startups now we've got some big primes at the other end we're not good at scaling and we don't have a financial system despite the fact we've got you know one of the world's great financial systems it does not invest in science and technology scale ups and our pension funds don't do it so that I think is a big area that lots of people are trying to unlock now and if we unlock that, that would make a massive difference. And the example that says that that's likely to be true is in Canada, where um, the teachers' pensions have been consolidated into one massive fund, and that fund has got a significant proportion in science and technology. The upshot of that has been they've done rather well on their science and tech scale-ups, and the pensions have done rather well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's an important area to... to, to, to Look at uncertainty is 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 absolutely key. Um, yeah, you know, I think there are four things that the science advisor needs to think about. Um, is the evidence base adequate, and if not, what are you going to do about it? The second is, has the evidence been understood with the uncertainty? And I think that's a key role of the science advisor to make sure the uncertainty has been properly articulated, and to assure yourself that somebody has understood that. It's not enough just to say it. You've got to test that that's been understood. The third is, has the um, scientific advice been framed in a way that's relevant to policy? And that may sound trivial, but actually it's very often the case that the scientists will just want to say something that's important because it was discovered yesterday. Mm. That's not science advice. It has to be something that's relevant to policy and framed in a way that somebody can use. And the fourth and really crucial one, which is often missed out, is how can science be used to monitor the effects of the policy that somebody's chosen to, to adopt? And that's what we don't do very well, actually. Go back and look, has it actually worked or not? Yeah. And then Adib, who I will call out here now, who asked the, the question about diversity and inclusion, was absolutely brilliant at um, getting the Chief Scientific Advisor Network um, working really well when he was in charge of that in Go Science. So thank you, Adib, for everything you did there. Um, I think we know that we've got a problem on diversity and inclusion um, in science and engineering. We know we've got um, you know low, relatively low percentages uh, of women in engineering in particular, but the massive effort made by the Royal Academy to try and um, change that. Um, we have seen changes in government over the past few years. Um, I think in the Government Office for Science, I think now we're 60% women and 40% men, I think. Um, but And we know we've got more um, women as chief scientific advisors in departments than there were. And so things are moving in the right direction. But, but it, it's something that we absolutely can't just ignore or assume is going to get right on its own. 
And given the scale of the problems we try and tackle, it's so blindingly obvious that we need diversity. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to solve the problems that this isn't a nice to have. This is a fundamental underpinning necessity. Mm -hmm. and, and the last batch of questions, they could be very brisk, please, because we've... Uh, yes, and then we must move out. Oh, I think there's someone on the other side. Here is yep. Matsura, Embassy of Japan. Um, on the part of the public, there is a growing concern or uh, science pessimism in the sense that the uh, overdevelopment of science, particularly in the AI, bioengineering, or the lethality of the weapon, may take the controlling power away from the mankind or the majority of the mankind. And uh, what is the, in your view, what is the best way to the, uh, address in, in terms of speaking to the, the public mind in a convincing and the sincerest way? That's a big question. Um, we've got, I think there's a hand up there. Yes, towards the back, yep, yep. Thank you, I'm Jane Gates. I'm from uh, an organization called Airto. Um, just want to ask if you could reflect a little bit on the important role that regulation has to play in driving science and innovation. And I think, um, you know, we see a situation where lots of politicians particularly are keen to uh, dial back on regulation, but uh, what can we do from your perspective to stop our regulatory environment from being eroded? Um, and then the final thought really was around your view on the whole government rhetoric for the science superpower and whether you think that has a, a future as a sort of a, a overarching ambition for the UK. And then I think there was one other question, maybe I was, I was yes, that's right. There was, yes, the gentleman there with his hand up. Yeah. Um, I'm Alex. Uh, my question is, is about um, getting scientifically literate MPs in the House of Commons. Uh, um, I know there's only one chartered engineer in the House of Commons. Okay. Well, I think, I mean, that's a, I think that's, we've caught everybody. We're just about on time. So you, this is an opportunity, you can range from the global metaphysical question of whether mankind is going to lose control of its own destiny through to a crucial agent in all that, the composition of the House of Commons. Um, and so, but also, Patrick, just the, your final observations you want to share with us have been absolutely fascinating. And you have been so skillful and informed in answering this wide range of questions. But your final observations for us and, and um, uh, reflections or perhaps on the advice you would give your successor as she takes up her role, uh, what you hope and would uh, recommend to her? Um, so, so thank you. The first question is a huge question and I don't know the answer to it. Um, but uh, I think there are, two, there are two dimensions I'd like to just pick up on. The first is there is a very grave risk that the reverse happens, that in other words, you get such a, an ill-informed backlash against the technologies that we stifle really important advances and we've seen that in the past around um, genetic modification and gene editing and um, uh, we saw it around nanotechnology with the worry there'd be some grey goo that takes over the world so I think there's a danger that we end up going the other way um, and I, I think that the fundamental importance of all of this is to have a proper open public debate around science and the more science can be seen as something that individuals, voters and citizens care about, and the more they see it as problem solving and are asking politicians or local representatives, what are you doing with science and technology to make my life better? And what can be done to solve the problem I've got? The, the more likely is we can have a proper, proper debate about this. But I, you know, I don't obviously do not know the answer to the important question you, you, you asked. Regulation's key, and um, I was asked to do some work on regulation over the last few months by the Chancellor, and um, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments on that. The first is um, regulation actually supports innovation if you get it right, which is your, your point, and um, regulator behaviour is as important as regulations. And the example I'll give is during um, the pandemic, the MHRA was absolutely brilliant 
there was no change in regulation at all, but there was a massive change in regulator behavior in terms of how they interacted with industry and others and looked after the progress of vaccines and therapeutics through the system. So regulators are, are key and they need to be properly supported. And they need the right skill sets in them. And that also comes back to salaries and how you attract people in there. And then on regulation, I think it's perfectly okay to diverge in regulation at an early stage in a technology's life um, so that when people don't know how to regulate, there's an advantage in being the regulator that's prepared to be expert and do things a bit differently. As technologies mature, companies don't want 54 different regulations around the world. They want harmonization. So we've got to get that balance right between regulation to stimulate innovation and then harmonization as we move through. Um, uh, science superpower you, you asked about I, I mean I I think the words are, are not for me they're for politicians to think about um, I do I think that this country ought to be um, based in large part on being great at science and technology and that can feed economic growth societal well-being health and other areas yes I absolutely do I, I think it's fundamental to what we're doing um, and the House of Commons uh, House of Commons um, uh, question is exactly why I think science and technology needs to be something that voters and citizens and people care about because then that will lead to a change in representation uh, in due course but we're a long way away from that at the moment. Um, David you, you asked about um, reflections and advice for my successor. I'll make one general comment which is my wife who didn't know what Go Science was thought it was some sort of rallying cry and and she, she thought a lot of people sort of with, with pom-poms and things saying go science so, so that's probably what needs to happen that we need to get that sort of thing uh, going to, to have a real rallying call for it um i don't need to give advice to my successor because she's brilliant mm -hmm. and she's absolutely um a, a superb been a superb chief scientist at the mod very smart and uh will do great things Wonderful. Well, that is a great note on which to end, because that is uh, something we all hope and believe and expect. And uh, but Patrick, it is uh, she'll be working on the basis of a fantastic legacy that you are leaving and the way in which you have informed so many discussions, both bringing scientific rigor and evidence uh, to and knowledge to so many decisions, but also then increasingly shaping our own science policy and institutional environment i think it's a, a fantastic contribution you have made over the last few years and we hope that in different ways you continue to make a contribution and thank you very much for coming here this evening thank you david thank you well i think we're going to adjourn for a a drink uh, next door if people have time. Thank you, David. Thank you.